and welcome to EGM 702, Week 5, Part 4, Machine Learning Classification Techniques. In the previous lesson, we discussed different machine learning approaches, including unsupervised machine learning, where we provide the machine with no information about the input data and ask it to sort or categorize or find the structure that is present within the data. When supervised machine learning, we provide the machine with labeled input data that it then uses to figure out what the function or pattern is uh, that goes into classifying that data, so that when we provide it with new data that it hasn't seen before, it knows how to classify it. And finally, reinforcement learning, where we, uh, depending on the outcomes or the actions that the machine that the machine learning algorithm takes, we reward it or punish, punish it based on whether the action that it takes uh, helps it to achieve whatever goal we have in place. Of these, at least in the realm of, um, uh, in the realm of remote sensing, the most prevalent type of machine learning that is used is supervised machine learning, and that is what we will cover in the rest of this lesson. Before we get too far into that though, I want, to dis I want to introduce the topic of decision trees. So a decision tree is similar to a flowchart where we have input data and we have a series of steps that we follow to determine what to classify that input data as. We have nodes in our decision tree, and this is where we test different attributes. For example, here we have uh, a node where we're looking at the value in band one, which might be, for example, here the red band of a particular satellite image. And we're classifying or we're dividing our data into two different groups based on whether the pixel values are bright in the red band or dark in the red band. And then after that, we move on to the next set of nodes uh, in order to continue classifying until we get to our final classification layer. Um, the branches of the decision tree are the particular test outcomes that we have. So for the band one example here, one branch is where the pixel value is greater than 82, and one is where it is less than or equal to 82. And then finally, the leaf nodes are the final nodes where we actually have the class labels. So you can see here we have the uh, wetland, dead vegetation, also dead vegetation, bare soil, wetland, and water um, that are being classified um, as we move our way through the decision tree. So another way of thinking about this is that we are recursively partitioning our data set into more and more homogeneous subsets of the data. We are classifying the input data based on a series of different attributes or decisions. Um, we're taking, again, the objects or pixel values as an input and returning classes as the output. Another type of machine learning classification that we'll discuss in this lesson is what's known as a random forest classifier. So a random forest is just an ensemble of individual decision trees. Get it? When we're trying to classify an object or a pixel or whatever it is that we're trying to trying to identify, we run the we run each of our individual decision trees on that particular object and they all produce different outcomes. So for example here we have an object that we're running through our first tree and it returns a value for class A. We run it through our second tree, it returns a value for class B. We keep going until we get to the end of the forest, it returns a value of class B. The final classification, the one that we use in our final output, is based on the majority of the individual trees. So you can think of this as a way of using the wisdom of the crowd to help us do our classification. We ask each of our individual trees to classify a particular object, and we take the majority of the results and use that for our final classification. We'll also 
another another type of machine learning classification that we'll talk about and it's quite popular in different remote sensing applications is a support vector machine so the aim here with using a support vector machine is to find the location of the decision boundary to separate different classes so if we're given two different classes so here represented by our red dots and our yellow dots we're trying to find the line or the hyperplane that leaves the greatest margin or the greatest distance between the two different classes. The margin, again, is just the distance between the hyperplane and the closest points in each of the different classes. These closest points are what are known as the support vectors, so that's where the name comes from. If our classes are not linearly separable that is that you know we might have some overlap between them there's no nice simple way to differentiate between them then what we're trying to do is maximize the margin while also minimizing the misclassification and we rather than using a single line we might use um, we might use a piecewise hyperplane in order to do this separation Ordinarily, uh, this approach is used for a binary problem, so you know, we're separating into two distinct classes, uh, but it can be adapted for multi-class uh, applications. In the previous lesson, I mentioned deep learning, which is a field of machine learning or a field of artificial intelligence that is based on modeling how the human brain or how animal brains work. So the way that this works is using something called an artificial neural network or ANN. This is a network of different connected nodes that can communicate with each other or transmit signals to each other and each of the different nodes is what's known as a neuron. So this is again based on modeling or based on how we understand human brains to actually function, where we have different neurons that are communicating with each other in order to process all of the things that our brains process. Each of the different neurons are connected or have a connection with a weight that is adjusted as we learn. So we can have more communication from between particular neurons, we can have less communication between particular neurons. Again, this is one of the things that is sort of tweaked as we train up our, our neural network. The neuron is something that uh, processes a particular input signal, which is really just a value, um, that then outputs uh, a value to the next node in the network using a nonlinear function, which is known as an activation function or a transfer function or an activation transfer function. Um, it's just a way of determining whether the network, whether this neuron is going to send a signal to the next, um, to the next neuron or not. This, uh, once the neuron transmits the signal to other neurons, they can move on to the next layers in our network. Uh, and eventually, from our initial inputs, we have outputs that are in the remote sensing case at least thematic map classes so we get a classified map um, out of this. Each of these neurons are aggregated into different layers which are sometimes also called hidden layers and we can have any number of different layers that, that work into our network. So to sum all of this up Machine learning has a number of different applications that we can use for remote sensing classification. Uh, in the next slide, we'll have a number of different papers that summarize a lot of the uh, a lot of the work that's been done in this field. Different applications are going to be better suited for certain algorithms or certain approaches. So before you before you start applying a particular approach or a particular algorithm. You need to think a little bit about what it is that you're trying to do, what data you have, uh, and so on. 
Uh, this is machine learning is a particularly powerful method for classifying or pa uh, identifying patterns in images, especially when we're working with large amounts of data, as we increasingly are in remote sensing applications. Um, so, for example, we can use machine learning to do automated detection or mapping of different features or objects, and when we have large numbers of images, this is especially useful. A number of different additional resources. Um, chapter 10 of Jensen covers a lot of this in more depth. Um, there's also an article from 2005 by Pal and Pal and Mather, which cover different, uh, I think one of these is random forest, uh, or discusses the use of random forest in remote sensing, and one of them discusses support vector machines. And then two very good um, review articles that cover a lot of the work that's been done in remote sensing uh, using machine learning. So that's all I have for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to post them to the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.